to not live in the Senate. I was hoping that we could concur in the ratification of the um, Asian Infrastructure uh, Investment Bank, which is like the counterpart of China, of the World Bank or the uh, ADB. It is not yet in the Senate, but still good enough so that we are one of the founding members of the AIIB and um, it's an infrastructure fund with how many um, billions, if not trillions, uh, ready uh, for uh, concession alone um, for the Philippine government. I think it's just uh, really the administrative functions that needed to be done in the office of the president. When China was just about to establish this bank, there was a lot of criticism over what they were trying to do, and that is to be the counterweight to institutions like the ADB and the World Bank. And if you look at it, China does have the lion's share of the voting rights. I'm talking more than 26 percent, whereas a country like the Philippines, which has really urgent infrastructure needs, gets only about 1.1 percent. In the long run, do you foresee that to be a problem? I don't think so. I, I think... Um First, we should seize the opportunity of being considered one of the founding members of AIIB. Second, we already have allocated our funds for 2017 because there's an investment. You don't simply become a member and not invest anything. I don't have the exact amount, but um, that's already allocated in our NEP, the National Expenditure Program for 2017. And if you don't ratify it this year, then we'll have to delete that provision in the budget. And third, as I said, it would be to the advantage of the Philippine government and the private sector as well that we are a member, so that's another source of um, funding for massive infrastructure spending. Now, Senator, at the launch of the European Union's Access to Sustainable Energy program, you pledged to double or even triple the NEA budget to you know, push for a rural electrification. How is that coming along? And is the target still um, full household, rural household electrification by 2020? Only 73% of our rural electrification is actually done, meaning there's so much to do for rural electrification, while 94% for the urban areas. Much of Mindanao, I think um, there's only 54%, if I'm not mistaken, are electrified. So there's much to do there. NEA says that we need 24 billion pesos to fully electrify, energize the country by 2020. I would like to see whether the National Electrification Administration or NEA would have the absorptive capacity if I give them the budget, because you can give the budget, but they're not capable of doing it ASAP because they have problems with electric cooperatives or with the homes or establishment of wiring. And I am focused on CTU electrification. I hope that uh, during my watch in the next three years as a chairman of the Finance Committee, I could help energize the whole country. Lastly, Senator, there's been a lot of talk over uh, the president's big pivot to China, over his uh, anti-U.S. rhetoric, as well as his, uh, you know, very warm language towards Beijing. As someone who has to deal with international bodies quite frequently, do you see any uh, consequence over that, over that change in uh, policies? The president of the Republic of the Philippines is the architect of all foreign policy. Everything emanates from him. And so his policy of an independent foreign policy states that we must expand and open our horizons and uh, do perhaps increased economic activity, more uh, trade with China. And we should consider China as a source of investments, as a source of a market, even a market for our goods. And, and that's good. I guess I'm wondering just how much more difficult it makes your job. Uh, for instance, let's take two steps back. We were just talking about the European Union, European Union's uh, grant for renewable energy in the Philippines. There is a second tranche of that, and there's already there's questions as to whether they might, you know, uh, hand that over as well, given the uh, cooling, shall we say, relations between the Philippines and the EU. I think everybody's mature here, and they see that commitments are commitments and that um, the EU has said that um, the aid, the assistance will continue. Rhetoric is rhetoric and relationships of long standing, decades long, and um, many of our infrastructure projects, many of our renewable energy projects, many of our climate assisted projects are there. Rhetoric is one thing, but relationships is another. So the world 
I think the precedent is going the right direction by opening up to other areas which might not have been fully opened up before, and China is just there. I've always believed that we must um, exhaust uh, our economic relations and build stronger cultural, um, agricultural uh, diplomacy efforts with China. The Philippines is considered always in the top three, top four most vulnerable nations in the world. And so it just makes simple common sense for the Philippines to ratify a very important climate agreement. And I think that we are on our way to getting there. Uh, as we know, the process of ratification is quite a tedious process. Here's the thing, though. We've all heard President Duterte speak unequivocally about why he is against the Philippines ratifying the deal. I did not hear that. Uh, I think that's an inaccurate reporting because if you will actually listen to the president, he is for climate justice. All he's saying is that we have not yet industrialized. We cannot be stymied in our economic development and therefore the nations that have industrialized and are the biggest emitters in the world must help the Philippines and many others like us. So the president is simply espousing climate justice. He never said we will not ratify the agreement unless I've not seen or read that report. So I think with all due respect, reporters and journalists must understand where the president is coming from. He is the president of a hundred million people of a very vulnerable nation that needs assistance from industrialized nations. And so what he's saying is that help us. We need the help. You cannot uh, ask us to sign an agreement and ask us to mitigate, period. It must be mitigation, adaptation, technology transfer, and assistance and capacity building. I understand where he's coming from. At the proper time, I'll have a chance to explain it to him. That's a very fair point, Senator, but we do have him on tape saying that he will not honor the agreement. And I think the bone of contention is the fact that we had committed to reduce emissions by 70 percent by 2030. Let, let me again correct you. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just have to say this. Uh, it's not legally say this binding, right yes. No, it's but not it's that a, it's not legally it, binding. It, it's still what we put forth. Nothing in the agreement states that we have to reduce emissions by 70%. In fact, in our INDC, we had submitted a 70% reduction in emission conditional on the technical and financial assistance of the industrialized nations. In short, the Green Climate Fund of $100 billion can be accessed by the Philippines for mitigation, for adaptation, for renewable energy, for capacity building, for mangrove rehabilitation, planting, uh, many of that. So, assuming it is simply a mitigation agreement, then the president uh, probably uh, means that who are we to mitigate, to reduce when we are a 0 0.3 emitter in the world? And that makes a lot of sense, but because it is both mitigation and adaptation. And at the proper time, I'm sure all of these will be explained to him. The 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from year 2000 to 2030 based on technical and financial assistance is a contribution of vulnerable Philippines to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the world, and it's voluntary. It does not say that uh, embargo will be done on our trade if we don't meet it. And so once we ratify the agreement, then we can access the Green Climate Fund. So just to be very clear, we are still pressing ahead with ratif ratifying the yes, Paris of Agreement. Of course. I just spoke to the Executive Secretary. I had a committee hearing in the Finance Committee with the NEDA Secretary. Um, I believe uh, it will be unanimous concurrence in ratification in the Senate. So th th there's really, uh, I really think that the way media covers it, uh, it's not easy to understand. You can't say it in a soundbite. You can't explain it in one article, just like they can't explain the president's thoughts and words in 30 seconds. I'll repeat what I said. He was batting for climate justice, which is justified. Now, once it is explained that the whole process is voluntary, 
then I am sure it will be transmitted. But Senator, the clock is ticking because the Paris deal comes into full force November 4th. We've already hit the threshold of 55% of uh, carbon emitters in the world. Um, how soon can we get this going? They have to study it, all departments. That's a process of ratification. It does not mean that we are disqualified from ratifying it just because we are not part of the what part of the 55% or more that ratified it before November 4. In fact, um, up to December, January, uh, that will eventually be ratified.